Great, thanks. I just, I'm not sure, is this, uh, is this working fine? Like yeah, we can you... see everything with you. Yeah, see your slides and you're in the, right. the screen too. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't, this is, um, I think I haven't done the presentation by teams before. So, uh, okay, I, yeah, I'm happy to take it on a bit early. Um, thank you very much for um, allowing me to, to be here. I'm generally really excited about it. I think the, the conference has been absolutely fantastic so far and also brilliantly organized. Um, so as you've heard in, the, uh, in Sam's introduction of the afternoon session, uh, my name is Anna Scheel. I'm a PhD student at Eindhoven University of Technology. Um, and I study uh, research practices, in particular in uh, psychology and research behavior. And today I will present um, the new, a new article format called Registered Reports, or now not so new anymore, depending on uh, how you view it. Um, which is meant to be, um, which is meant to mitigate a lot of the problems that have been discussed in the um, in the presentations in this morning in the morning sessions. Um, so I won't be able to rehash all uh, the details of questionable research practices and publication bias and problematic incentives and also fraud um, that have been uh, fantastically um, explained to you by Stuart, Amy, uh, Dorothy, and Marcus. Um, but I very briefly want to rehash uh, the, the main problems by using an analogy that um, uh, that Dorothy Bishop came up with a few years ago on her blog. Um, so I love this blog post by her where she introduced the uh, a, a metaphor um, called the amazing Significo, um, who is a magician who does card tricks. And the idea is that the amazing Significo um, deals you a poker hand, which is five cards, uh, and uh, announces that he can deal you three of a kind, which is a five cards and three of these of the same kind. So for example, three aces um, or three of the same number. And um, by random chance, the, um, the chance that you would get a card like that on uh, by accident or a hand, sorry, would be 2%. So it's quite rare that you just get that by accident. And if somebody can thus successfully predict that they will deal you the sand, it should be quite, um, uh, it should be quite impressive. So um, here, let's uh, let's look at the uh, amazing significo. So this is the first scenario that uh, Dorothy uh, used in her blog post. So significo announces that he will deal you three of a kind in a five hand uh, uh, deal, and he succeeds. So if somebody does that to you, just comes up to you, say, I will do you a three of a kind hand, um, you should be pretty impressed, uh, assuming, of course, that you can uh, have some certainty that they didn't cheat, that the deck of cards was properly mixed and fair, and that they didn't have ad uh, additional cards up their sleeve, of course. Um, but now let's imagine the second scenario, which is that Significo does the same thing, but you know that he actually went to 49 other people before coming to you, tried the same thing and failed. So there have actually been 50 attempts of doing this and only one of them succeeded, which is exactly what we would expect by random chance, uh, given that there's a 2% chance of getting this hand. Now, presumably, you would be a lot less impressed. Right? But the uh, interesting thing is that all that differs is that in this scenario, you know that there have been 49 other cases and you are just the lucky one. In scenario one, you don't know. Um, and it could have been the case. Um, now, there's a third scenario um, I came up with because I think this is maybe closest with our situation in the scientific literature, which is significant deals you um, three of a kind and then says that was intentional and planned. Um, so um, at this point, you wouldn't, I mean, in the real world, we would just laugh at a person who does that, I guess, just coming up to you, dealing you five cards. You look at them and they say, I predicted that. Um, so that would, we would typically not be very impressed by that. Um, and yet this is what happens a lot in, in scientific publications is that authors will say, um, here are results that support this hypothesis. And we predicted that. We predicted this outcome from the start. Um, but they don't provide evidence that they actually did predict it before they knew the results. So um, these are 
metaphors for um, questionable research practices that Amy um, so brilliantly explained in the morning session. Um, so for example, most um, commonly, of course, selective reporting, which would be the second scenario that um, there has been a success, but uh, what you don't know is that there have been other um, cases uh, where somebody didn't succeed and you don't know. So this is like you, you have been like a positive result has been cherry picked uh, from more results that were out there. Um, and then the third scenario might have been a case of hacking where somebody uh, gets a result and then um, says it was predicted that way or, or sort of spins the story around the result that already exists. Um, although in this case, I mean, it could have been uh, genuine, of course, but we don't know. Um, and in all these cases, um, it is sort of on the researcher that they uh, might not be telling us the whole truth, right? So here we could all say this is all, that's why we call it questionable research practices. It is sort of not entirely okay. Um, and some of the, um, some important information is held back. Now, but there's a different um, scenario where researchers might not behave in any questionable manner at all. And um, I call this the, the story of the magician who didn't make the news. So we can imagine a fourth scenario in which there are 50 different magicians, uh, all independently from each other. Uh, they didn't talk to each other ahead of time. And they all try this trick that the Am uh, amazing Significo tries. So uh, announces uh, dealing somebody a three of a kind hand. Um, and one of these 50 magicians succeeds. Uh, now, that one person, um, in, in the case in which it succeeds, the, the person that they do this trick to might be really impressed and might be saying this is maybe something that might make the news, right? Somebody uh, um, did, made such, a, such an impressive prediction and succeeded. Um, but the 49 other cases where it didn't work, uh, nobody's going to pay any attention to. And rightly so, it's just not very uh, interesting. So I think this is a this might be a nice analogy for publication bias. So in this case, uh, the 50 magicians didn't hold back any information. They didn't um, they didn't do anything questionable. They were all perfectly truthful. Each of them only tried this trick once. But there's one person who randomly succeeds, and that is the person who we put on the news because it's interesting. Um, and we don't talk about the other ones. Um, so this is why I think it's really important to keep in mind that if we end up with a newspaper that is filled with stories about magicians like this, about amazing significos, I think probably uh, correctly it should be amazing significi. Um, it's, it's meaningless unless we know if each of them really told us everything that they did, or if they're holding back information that is important for us to judge how impressive it was. But also we need to know how many other cases are out there that didn't make the news. Um, because as long as there are enough people trying something, we can always select the random success successes. Um, and it might not mean anything. It might all be random. So, um, I just want to, because um, my background is in psychology uh, and I study this, the psychology literature uh, a lot in my own research. Uh, and it's just so um, such a such a nice example for this problem of a um, of an amazing literature, or as Samin Vazi likes to say, an incredible literature. Um, so psychology has journals that are filled with positive or significant results. So results where um, studies find support for attested for their research hypotheses uh, or significant results uh, very often. So there are several studies now um, stretching back to the 1950s that find consistently that more than 90% of the studies in the scientific literature in, in psychology uh, have positive results where authors find support for the tested hypothesis. Now, that's quite impressive as it is, but it becomes truly amazing or incredible if we consider another piece of information, which is that we also have pretty good evidence that statistical power in psychology um, has been pretty low over the decades until today, um, which means statistical power is the probability of finding an effect if it truly exists. Um, and it depends uh, on your sample size, among other things. 
So uh, larger samples, um, with larger samples, it will be it's more likely that you will detect an effect that truly exists. Uh, and larger effects are easier to detect than smaller effects. And since psychologists have been uh, used to pretty small, modest sample sizes, the statistical power, so the likelihood of finding an effect if it exists, has been unimpressive, let's say. Um, here's a recent study that is very comprehensive that suggests that even for large effect sizes, average power in the literature is just 37%. So up to three quarters, and this is for large effects. So for effects that are smaller, it is much less. So if we compare these numbers, it just becomes very obvious that something is something weird is going on, because if we take the findings from the uh, literature on, on statistical power, we would think that even if all hypotheses that psychologists have uh, or test are true, um, we would expect only maybe three quarters uh, of studies to show a positive results or less, probably more, probably much, much less than that. But in the literature, we have this, these amazingly high success rates of, of more than 90%. So yeah, maybe just as a reminder, once again, the newspaper or maybe a scientific journal that is filled with amazing significos or with tons of significant uh, novel groundbreaking results is meaningless unless we know if in these studies we're really being told everything um, that matters, if everything everything that has been done or if some information is held back, and if we know how many other studies are out there that we don't hear about. So um, we can, uh, some of the, 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 the tension um, that we see in the research culture that have been uh, mentioned in the morning sessions uh, can be uh, I think be, be shown in, in this case here. So if we think about for researcher, which part of a research study do you believe should be beyond your control as a scientist? Um, the hopefully obvious answer should be the results. And that is because, of course, we want to control lots of parts of a research study to design a good study. Um, but the results are really the empirical answer that we want to get from uh, the answer that we want to get from the empirical world. Um, and yet, the other question is, which part of a research study do you believe is most important for advancing your career? And again, often the answer is the results. So this is um, something that we should not be able to control and yet everything hinges on it. Or as um, Chris Chambers, from whom I've uh, stolen a lot of my slides today, um, has put it, um, don't touch this, don't touch the results, but they better be amazing. Um, and this obvious tension is another another way of, of um, showing it is um, that what is best for science and what is best for scientists is not the same in our current research culture. Um, and it likely um, is to the detriment of science at the moment. So what is best for science uh, obviously is high quality research that is published regardless of outcome. Or to get back to the amazing Significo, we always want to know um, everything that was done so that we can properly interpret the things that we see and know what they mean. Um, but what is bet best for scientists uh, is often just producing a lot of great results that make the news, right? That that make it into, um, into the literature. Um, and it might not lead to the best outcome for science and it probably actually doesn't. Um, okay, so registered reports now to come to one of the proposed solutions is a new article format that was designed um, to solve this tension between to basically um, align what is best for science and what is best for scientists. The way it works um, is this. So it, it has a restructured um, review timeline basically compared to normal scientific articles. In registered reports, what you do is uh, like in a normal study, you develop an idea and design your study. But then before you actually go and collect the data um, to run your study, um, you submit a proposal of this study that is basically the introduction section of your paper and the method section to a journal. And uh, it gets reviewed before the results are known, before you know the results, before the reviewers know the results, before the editor knows the results. Um, and at this point, um, 
re reviewers will uh, look at if the research question is important and if your um, supposed um, suggested methods for answering the research questions um, are sound and are good. And if um, the review is positive and reviewers say, yes, good question, good way to, to try and study it, you get a so-called in-principle acceptance, meaning that at this point, the journal will commit and say, we will publish your study uh, if you go and collect your data and analyze it the way that you just said you would. We will publish this final paper regardless of what the results are. Um, so even, even if the results are actually negative and uh, it turns out that your hypotheses are not supported. So if you have this in principle acceptance in hand, you can go collect and analyze your data, write up the, the final parts of the study. Uh, and then we get to a second review stage at this point. Um, where, but in this, but now this second review round, uh, review stage um, is uh, different from the first one because now um, what the reviewers look at is only if you stuck to the plan that was registered in the beginning um, and if your data uh, pass certain quality standards so that we know that nothing went terribly wrong and the data are completely uninformative. Um, but it doesn't matter if your um, results were positive or negative, for example, um, and then it gets published. So what this means is that the um, we have a, a, a registration. So basically you uh, make your hypotheses and methods and analysis pipeline public. You publicly, you show your plan to other people through the reviewers and it eventually becomes public. Um, so that's a kind of pre-registration. And we have a publication decision, bef and which is here at stage one, the journal commits to publishing the final result before any one of the involved players knows the results. And that means uh, none of the sort of a lot of the bias that creeps in because we want interesting, and positive and novel results gets cut out because all these decisions that something ends up in the literature become independent of the results. Um, so that means it reduces questionable research practices because authors can't claim that their hypotheses were different than they really were. They can't switch out their, their analyses after the fact and publication bias. Uh, also gets reduced because um, the journal, because of this commitment to publish uh, and because it would be probably unlikely that authors withdraw their paper at the second stage if they already have a guaranteed publication. Um, I'm going to quickly skip uh, over this because we already uh, just went through this. So authors submit stage one uh, manuscript, get peer reviewed and then get this in principle acceptance. Um, and basically the stage one manuscript is just the introduction section of a result uh, of a paper and a method section. Um, and then at this um, at stage one, the review criteria are really just, uh, as I just said, the, um, the importance of the research question, if this is an interesting question to ask, um, if your proposed hypotheses make sense, um, if your methods are sound and your planned analysis, um, and what is also, I think, interesting is if you are reporting your methods in sufficient detail that other people could replicate your study. Um, and if you have pre-specified outcome neutral quality checks so that after the fact we can see if your study worked out as planned or, for example, if an important instrument broke or didn't um, actually um, give you the kind of data that was expected. Um, then after you actually do the research and come back at stage two. What you now do, you basically just add the results and discussion to your manuscript. So the introduction and methods basically remain unchanged as they were. So they were your registered part and that protocol also gets published. Um, and then we have another, as I said, another round of peer review at stage two. Um, and at this point, so the stage two review criteria um, are basically just if your outcome neutral quality checks are met, if we can know that your data was actually informative for the research question, um, if your introduction, rationale and hypothesis are the same, so you can't go back and change stuff after the fact, of course. Um, if you adhere to your experimental procedures as you said you would, so sometimes there will of course be um, deviations, but they should be very minor and they have to be justified and discussed. Um, 
and if any unregistered post hoc analyses that you did. So you can always add things that were not registered at stage one. You can say we did some exploratory analysis. They just have to be clearly labeled as such. Um, and they also have to be justified and, and sound and informative. And very importantly, if your conclusions are justified uh, given your data. Um, so you can't just uh, go wild and, and claim and overclaim uh, your, your results. Um, so really importantly, in light of what all the problematic uh, incentives we've heard in the, in the morning session, what does not matter is whether your hypothesis was supported. It doesn't matter if your results are significant. Uh, it doesn't matter if the results are novel or if they have impact uh, or any of these things. It, the, as I said, the decision to publish is not made on the results. It is made before the results are known and these outcomes can just be evaluated in, in light of, of the research question as an, an, as an actual answer to the research question. Now, that has obvious advantages for science. Um, so as I already said, it prevents or reduces questionable research practices that, for example, switching the outcomes, selectively reporting things that worked, uh, or after the fact, uh, switching uh, your hypotheses. Um, and as I said, it reduces publication bias because I said the decision to publish is made ahead of time. Um, what I think is really important is it also likely improves the um, study design and rigor, and that is because the stage one review um, provides input on the methods of the paper before the study is run. So outside experts, the peer reviewers, can give uh, input and it can still uh, be used to improve the study. In a normal review process, that input gets uh, is made after the study has already been run. So basically, reviewers can say you had a critical flaw in your study design or this was a really bad decision, but there's nothing you can do about it anymore. Whereas in registered reports, um, it often it is a much more constructive process because reviewers say this would be a better way to measure this variable or this would be a better way to manipulate that and you can still go and change it. Um, also, registered reports often require a, a high standard of statistical power or sensitivity, so you have to have good justifications for your sample size. Um, and of course, they increase transparency and reproducibility because they they already designed with this eye to please make uh, make everything so clear that we can judge ahead of time uh, if it's a good way of you to to do this and if it can be uh, replicated by somebody else. If somebody else could go and do the same thing um, based on what on your description. Um, and now what's, where it gets really important in my view from an incentives perspective is that it also has advantages for the authors. So one of the things I just said is the same for the authors. You get feedback at stage one when it's most useful, namely when you can still change something. Um, so I really like this quote from uh, Ronald Fisher who said, um, to consult the statistician after an experiment is finished is often merely to ask him to conduct a post-mortem examination. He can maybe say, he can perhaps say what the experiment died of. Um, so I think this is a um, this is a nice quote that that probably um, resembles experiences pe many people have had in, in peer review, which is you, you see a, a study that has been done that might have been done very carefully, but it had a critical flaw in the uh, experimental setup and it invalidates the results and there's nothing the authors can do anymore. But in a registered report, authors can still uh, change that and, and, and fix those errors before, um, the, before data are collected. So that is probably also why it, registered reports improve your chances of getting a paper accepted, um, which is that uh, if there are problems with your study design, they can be changed. They are not, um, it's, it's, uh, they can still be fixed. So here are data from uh, Chris Chambers who edits registered reports at the journal Cortex. Um, who they, he says they have a 90% acceptance rate after um, passing the desk. There are more desk rejections, but the desk rejections often invite a resubmission. Um, and this is contrasted with a 10% acceptance a rate for normal articles that are not registered reports at the same uh, journal. And then, of course, it's extremely unlikely that you will get rejected at stage two. Um, so after the data have been collected, because that would really mean that you have to screw up quite dramatically. Um, of, and I think analysis and writing up 
uh, at the end of your project is easier uh, in registered reports because you have planned everything so precisely at stage one. Um, so you can really just follow your plan. Uh, and I think many of us, even though maybe we shouldn't do that, but I think many people know uh, the, the situation of having collected your data, looking at your data and realizing that you didn't think about how they should be analyzed. Uh, and now you're struggling and maybe you're even realizing that um, you made some unclever decisions. Um, but all that becomes much easier in registered reports because there's a clear plan. Um, and then, of course, importantly, you don't need to worry about the results. Uh, you don't need to put extra work into get something publishable out of negative results. Um, and what I think is another nice point is that, for, especially for early career researchers who don't have a lot of publications maybe uh, and need to think about what they can put on their CV, um, you can put papers with an in-principle acceptance, so a stage one um, a manuscript that is accepted at stage one, you can put that at your CV and say this is in-principle accepted at journal X. Um, and that is just much more impressive than saying I have this manuscript in preparation, which uh, nobody has seen yet, but it's like an ongoing study. Uh, and it's like this, this, this ghost or zombie study that nobody knows if it really exists. Um, so that is, I think, another nice aspect of it. Um, OK, so currently there are 244 journals offering registered reports. Almost all of them, of course, just as another format on uh, on top of the normal article formats that they offer. So nobody forces you to do a registered report. Uh, and they are now covering many different scientific fields, which is really nice. Um, and they are most popular yet because this is sort of where it's all started in neuroscience and in psychology, uh, but more scientific disciplines are catching up. And there have been almost 200 registered reports that have been published so far, so at stage two, finished papers. And um, now at the end, very briefly, I just want to go into um, looking at what these uh, published registered reports look like. Because of course, um, at the beginning, we thought we went in saying, this might be a nice way to fix some of these problems of getting from an incredible literature to a more credible one. Um, so let's look at what, what they actually look like. And um, there have been two studies uh, that I know of, at least, that looked into this. The first is by um, uh, Chris Allen and David Mela uh, last year, who um, had an opinion piece in PLOS Biology, and they did a, um, a survey of the um, uh, published registered report in psychology and biomedicine. And they uh, found that uh, about 40% of published registered of hypotheses in published registered reports had um, positive results, so supported the hypothesis, 40% only. Remember what I showed you in the beginning, positive results in the standard literature in psychology were consistently over 90%. Um, the second study is, is by myself and my colleagues, uh, Mitchell Schrein and uh, Daniel Larkins, who's my supervisor, and we directly compared registered reports in psychology and uh, standard reports, so non-registered reports in psychology. Um, and we find, uh, as again, a super high rate of positive results in the standard literature, so 96%, and the registered reports um, drop to uh, 40, oh, sorry, sorry about that, um, to 43, 44% positive results. Um, so about half of that, which is a really dramatic uh, difference, I think. And I just want to highlight here that this is, to me, this is so interesting because you see these negative results are emerging in this registered reports literature. This is like all the failed magicians, you know, that we normally don't get told about, that we don't see, and now they're here. Now you can see them. Like this is the, the science that is being done, and you can look at all the science, and it allows you to uh, evaluate and, and interpret the results that you see in a, in a much more um, comprehensive and accurate way, I think, um, which is why I'm extremely fond of this, of this format. Um, OK, so finally, at the very end, very briefly, I want to say that um, as, a, as a very recent development, uh, registered reports um, have also now play a role in uh, research that focuses on uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So in uh, March, Chris Chambers, um, who basically invented registered reports and is editing them in many journals, is I think sort of the godfather of registered reports, 
um, put out a call um, uh, announcing a new fast fast track rapid response format in uh, Royal Society Open Science, where they promised a stage one review within just seven days for studies on COVID-19. Um, and he um, he gathered a, a network of reviewers who are willing to provide the super fast review um, that is now has over 800 reviewers ha have signed up for this. Uh, this same format is now offered by 11 journals um, uh, and Royal Society Open Science has by now already published two of these papers at stage two and six more have an in principle acceptance. Um, and I just think this is a terrific um, initiative, especially because there has been this um, flurry of papers um, on COVID-19 that have come up. So you can clearly say, I think that this has become a hot topic and not just in, in medicine, for example, but also in the behavioral sciences and in psychology where I'm at, um, where I've seen um, lots of papers being published at an extremely fast pace. And I've worried about bias creeping in at those, especially because things tend to get rushed. Things get so much more attention than usual. Um, that I think there's a greater risk for bias even than usual. Uh, and especially in this climate, I think um, using the registered reports format to, um, is even more important than for the regular literature, because here it really matters to get unbiased uh, evidence, I think, uh, more than even more than usual. Um, right, so um, this is where I'll end. Um, I have more slides and some frequently asked questions and objections. Um, but I will just pull them up um, in response to, to questions, perhaps, uh, as they fit. And people can, of course, look them up um, on, uh, can, op can look up my slides online. And I would encourage everyone to, to visit uh, the link and the, the page on registered reports that contains a lot of more, a lot more information. Uh, so thank you. Uh, wonderful, Anne. Uh, absolutely great. Um, I just quickly say we've got about six minutes for questions and also uh, we had a question from Talia Illy which was um, about resources, uh, about registered reports and participating journals. I have just copied and pasted the, the Centre of Open Science um, page with all of those kind of materials information and I've also given a link to Anne's slides as well. So I'll just move then on to the next uh, most popular question, which was by uh, Johnny Coleman. And he asks, in exploratory studies, it is common for analyses to change for valid scientific reasons. Does this void uh, acceptance in principle for a registered report? If so, what is the benefit of registered reports over the normal publication pipeline? Um, that is a uh, that is a great question. So there are um, two answers I will give. The first is that uh, any registered report can um, always contain additional exploratory analyses that are post hoc, that are really not in the stage one protocol, but that are added later on. And there is no limit on that. It is just uh, the format just basically makes it clear what is what. So you will have clearly show. The these analyses were um, set up after the um, after the data were already in, right? So, re so, um, so readers can really see that they were post hoc. Um, but as long as that is sort of honestly reported, it's totally fine to have them. So, registered reports don't stifle exploratory research in that sense. It just sort of makes destigmatizes it, I think, because I think uh, sometimes people are wary of exploratory research um, because they think it could be. Um, uh, sort of meant to look uh, as if it was planned a, a priori and it wasn't. So that is the first answer. Uh, the second answer is that the registered report format is of course heavily focused on confirmatory research. So for example, hypothesis testing research typically. Um, and um, it is less suited, suited for extremely open-ended exploratory research where you don't really have um, um, a, a hypothesis going in, for example. But um, there is a new initiative um, also started by the journal Cortex, uh, which is exploratory reports as sort of a sister format of registered reports. Um, and uh, this is sort of meant for more open ended uh, research that is sort of in, in parallel, where the idea is you, you don't really need this confirmatory aspect of it, but you can also document from the beginning what you go in with and what you don't yet know. Um, so, yeah, I hope that's a useful answer. Wonderful. Uh, I think that I think that definitely answered the question. Um, if, if if anybody does want to sort of carry that onto Twitter, that's absolutely fine. 
in the last few uh, minutes we have um, we have one quite long question but it's, it's got quite a lot of votes so bear with me I'll try and make it clear to you um, so first of all very interesting talk and conference considering the amount of time some journals need to review manuscripts do you think many researchers might be less prone to use registered reports due to the time restrictions in funding e.g postdocs that have to complete studies in 18 to 24 months that's the first part of the question and are journals who publish pre-registered studies usually quicker to review your study especially at the initial stages since they are likely to determine when you can start collecting your data um, that is a great question. Uh, also uh, really important, I think, especially like the um, question already says for early career researchers who might have more time pressure than people with tenure. Um, so um, first, there is uh, there is an initiative linking registered reports uh, to funding decisions and grants, particularly so where basically funding agencies work together with journals and, and authors and, and um, um, coordinate basically so that in the ideal case you would get um, your uh, you, you you would get your your funding decision at the same time that you get the stage the in principle acceptance from the journal sort of where that is coordinated um, there's also I think more information about that that you can find on the um, on the Center for Open Science website the registered reports website um, the other thing is about how long it takes in general to um, uh, to undergo review, peer review in registered reports. Um, I have, so I should know more about this than I can uh, uh, currently say because I had a, a student project that looked into that. Um, I, I supervised a student uh, where we looked into um, how long people uh, take for, how long papers take, um, spend how much time papers spend under review, registered reports compared to non-registered reports. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the data collection has been extremely uh, complicated and, and the data haven't been fully analyzed yet, but I think uh, it looks like you have two review stages, right? Stage one and stage two, compared to just one in the normal format. And it looks like they both take um, similarly long, like they are not half, they don't both take half as much time as normal review takes. So I don't think you save a lot of time. Um, in fact, you might actually have a bit, peer review for registered reports might take a bit more time than for normal papers on average, but it will vary. The advantage, of course, is that you ex your chances to get accepted are way higher. So for a normal paper, you will much more often have to resubmit the whole paper and maybe undergo several rounds of reviews at different journals. So there's a long tail that might cost you a ton of time. And for registered reports, when you once you're past stage one, you're sort of guaranteed um, to have the publication. Um, that said, the, the question of how long does it take to get the stage one um, um, uh, approval? I think at Cortex, Chris has said that it takes about nine weeks on average, maybe, uh, if I have that in my head correctly. Um, it will depend on the journal and of course on the reviews and how seriously people take it. There's, I think a good tip is to, if you're considering this and you are under time pressure, uh, for, for example, you have to start collecting data at time X and you know that, contact the editor ahead of time and just ask them if the, if it's feasible to get the paper through before this or if, it, or if not. I think that's the sort of the most practical advice I can give. Wonderful. Uh, I hate to to sort of close it there, but we've slightly gone over time and, and Kate's waiting in, in the wings. I think um, first of all, I need to thank you, especially because you're battling a cold that you've had and, and, and it won't go away. So thank you so much for for, for, for giving your time to this.